Welcome to an episode of Historically Speaking. I'm your host, Michael Dwyer, and our guest today is Rich L. Nicky, who will tell you a little bit about his special role in this presentation. The title of our program is Bringing Life to a Uniform, the Service of Dr. Harry L. Frost. And before turning this over to Rich, a little background on how this show came, to, uh, came into being. Last month, just before the taping of our previous show, um, Rich, who was my former student several years ago, had some materials that a very good friend of his, Rob Spensley, another former student, found. And as we gave a cursory look to these wonderful objects, I asked Richard if he were willing to organize a show around these. So that is the premise of this particular episode. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Mr. Elnicki. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dwyer. Um, yeah, so uh, over the summer, uh, Rob, my friend Rob, he bought a home in, uh, in Pittsburgh. And uh, he, he, there was a lot of stuff in this house, lots and lots of stuff. And um, there was one remaining uh, woman still living in the home. And she was from a long line of folks, uh, generations of that family that had lived there. So um, the house was in a bit of disrepair, so Rob got a good, you know, good price on it. And uh, so he's like, you know, you can come by if you'd like and, you know, take a look. And um, he, had, he had some dumpsters out there to kind of take care of a lot of stuff. So I chipped in a little bit there, but I was doing more of the treasure hunting. And uh, so um, we go out into the garage and we're... Uh, we're looking through some stuff, you know, and the, the animals had gotten the best of a lot of it, mm. unfortunately. And um, so it got to the point where he was going to have an estate sale. And he's like, you know, if you want to if you want to scoot out there and check it out before we do this one last time. And it was a really, really warm June day, I remember. So it was like, well, this time I'm going out. I'm going to go to the back of that garage and see what's there. And I, uh, I dug a little deeper and found a chest and in that chest, here was this uniform, some great pictures, some pennants and some hat. It's really a, it was really a really cool find. And I was there by myself, so I was kind of more or less celebrating by myself until I could get out and show people. So, yeah, that's it. So as you started to inventory these objects, what do you think you were looking at? Well, I, I mean, I obviously knew it was military. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was just trying to decipher... Uh, World War One versus World War Two, um, and then kind of what the person did in the military themselves, and um, and from the photos that uh, I came across, that kind of helped a little bit of information, and uh, and yeah, and, and actually the, there was the medal on the front that uh, kind of indicated the actual war itself, so that that helped too. So I was uh, very fascinated with that, and the fact that it was all in such good condition. Mm -hmm. So yeah. How about some of the other objects that were with this? We've got some banners here, uh, which we'll be looking uh, at slides of uh, in a little bit. So what do you think was the relationship of the banners to the uniform? Well, the uh, medical corps uh, uh, banner there, I believe he must have received it along the way through his education. That's what I was assuming. Mm -hmm. um, the, the star, actually, I really didn't have a full understanding as to what that was honestly and then and then the uh university of vermont um kind of like bag situation i guess i'm not exactly sure what that was either so i was very i was very fascinated by all of it i knew it all would tell a story i just didn't know what that story necessarily was so mm -hmm. yeah did you have any idea uh to whom all of this belonged originally well, we had um, some names here and there, snippets, mm -hmm. um, and it seemed to kind of all come back to a Dr. Frost. So um, we, that, that was, and, I, and so I, I held on to that little bit of information, and then uh, once, once we met up again here in the studio, I was like, I got to sh I've got to show you these things. So, yeah, that was it, yeah. Well, knowing uh, Pittsburgh is a small town, everyone knows everyone, uh, I knew the property that Rob bought, and I knew to whom it belonged. And um, Dr. Frost, whom uh, we'll say more about in a couple of moments, um, I knew his son. 
and I had visions of him uh, out on his porch, out in the yard. So immediately um, I started to decode uh, some of these things and with some of my own family members, a brother of my grandfather who was in World War I, I started to build up a picture of this. So let's start to look at some of these objects uh, which you photograph for us one at a time and the remarkable story uh, that they'll tell. So here is Dr. Harry Leslie Frost's World War I Medical Corps uniform. It's in remarkably good shape for 100 years old. And even though you've said that uh, animals got to this, the fact that this is still wearable uh, and not threadbare, it's not only a testament to good tailor workmanship, obviously for this to be preserved as long as it has, it's uh, a wonderful thing. And look at the metal um, on there. Uh, the metal, which um, I think is a French metal. Um, from where you're sitting, you might be able to see it may say France on it. Actually. Be yeah. uh, because he did uh, indeed spend some time in France. And you're absolutely right that this is the banner uh, of the Medical Corps. Um, you can see uh, the star and most importantly, the universal symbol of physicians since ancient times is the caduceus, where we can see uh, the snake uh, wrapped around the staff. Now, why would you think a banner like this would be necessary? You know, I, I'm not really entirely sure. And actually, now I'm seeing the relation to the star there. I can see it. That's uh, now it's all coming together. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess it's just a way to um, have it, an indicator, something to be something to hang up to show what you've been able to accomplish, perhaps, is what I'm Well, I, I think there's that. But also, it's a necessity when we get into the work that Dr. Frost did with the Red Cross, it identifies, it's almost like um, when you see in movies, they raise the white flag. Oh, okay, yes. um, You would have things like this as a way of signaling that this person was a physician. Uh, the banner, the next banner that we're about to see, this banner, plus the UVM uh, banner, this could be used in the same way that a flag symbolizes something. So here, uh, I can picture this going with him into wartime and perhaps being displayed outside a tent uh, that this would clearly show. So these aren't just decorations here. They serve their purpose in the context of the war. And the University of Vermont, and this is part of its seal, um, started out as an agricultural college, 1791. So we have a 130th anniversary, if my math is correct, 230th anniversary of the University of Vermont. And um, you can see here the Latin model studies uh, at uh, Rebus Honesti. So for uh, studies and honest, honest work, something, something to that effect, lamp of knowledge. But once again, um, Dr. Frost was born in 1890, so he was matriculating as a student at the University of Vermont in the early teens prior to World War I. So this is a great and colorful survivor. Now one of the things that you brought in, uh, a panoramic photo of the time rolled up here, and the, it's a little um, too small for us to pick out individual people. But do you know where this is? I believe it's 40th and Allen. I it think. is 40th yes. and yeah. Allen. Yeah. And um, you can see the parade ground. And I've heard stories from a lot of people who remembers, uh, remember that officers, cavalry officers, were trained here. So this is where you would see the horses on display. and. Um, I wouldn't be surprised 
if Dr. Frost uh, had some skill in riding a horse. But it's a great, it's a great survivor uh, of uh, the, the training ground, the parade ground at Fort Ethan Allen. And then we have this. So here is Dr. Frost. It's a great um, studio picture. Um, it's a great keepsake. You see the detail of the uniform. So there it is um, in C2 100 plus years ago. And there it is hanging up um, right there. Um, it's a wonderful survivor. I mean, part of the way that this has held up as well as it has is it was kept in a folder. So as we bring these items to life, one of the things that you and Rob will have to um, decide is that if descendants, and I know living descendants, suppose they want this back. Oh, we didn't know our great-grandfather's uh, right. picture yeah. um, ended up in a trunk, so you'll, you'll have to decipher that. But at, at the very least, it's a wonderful sense of discovery when we can bring back um, objects and understand the context in which they are, are generated. It's a real sense of the joy of discovery, not to mentioning something rescued that could have easily gone out yeah. uh, with a dumpster. So as we begin this um, particular story here, um, we'll start with Dr. Frost and his World War I service. Now, the irony is, as far as World War I service records are concerned, a good portion of veterans' records were destroyed in 1973 when there was a catastrophic fire at the National Archives in St. Louis, Missouri, where most of these records were kept. So we can find out more service information about Civil War veterans than we can with World War I. But um, one of the things that we can um, reconstruct from other sources is we know exactly through a uh, shipping manifest here of when Dr. Frost went as a soldier to France. So as you look at this passenger list here, uh, we see Dr. Frost's name is the second one. Uh, he is a captain in uh, the medical corps. Uh, it lists his wife's name, Christine. We'll get to her a little bit later uh, in uh, the show. And he left aboard the Canopic on July 21st, 1918. He left from New York. So at this point, the United States had been involved in the war for a year and a couple of months. President Wilson declared war on Germany in April of 1917. So presumably, Dr. Frost, already with his medical degree, had been training. So he leaves for France uh, at this point. We're in July. Some of the most intense fighting, the meurs argonne Offensive, is going to begin in September. So although we know the war ends in November of 1918, he is still going to see some very, very serious fighting. And from the Ad Adjutant General's um, office, so this was compiled in 1919, we see here the uh, prospectus on Harry Leslie Frost, he was born in Brattleboro. He was called into active service on the 16th of May. He was stationed at 40th and Allen, hence the picture, uh, and in Boston. And you can see he went through the ranks. Now, very interestingly here, we can see he went overseas. So he's in France from the 21st of July until the 2nd of April, 1919. So the armistice, as we know, is November 11th of 18, but there's still a lot uh, that has to be done. In France, there are still six soldiers, terribly wounded soldiers to take care of. So we had um, a lot of responsibility um, in France after war before he came home. So if you notice, he is discharged on the 2nd of April, 1919, 
in St. Agnon, France. But that's only the beginning of the very, very interesting story that we're about to unpack here. And we have here an emergency passport application that I found from Dr. Frost because as of April of 1919, um, he is no longer serving the United States Army. Um, he is in a, the Hotel Normandy in Paris at this point. And the reason that he is applying for an emergency passport is he's going to do relief work for the Red Cross. And this, from his passport application, gives us um, some very neat details. We know he was 28, not a big man, 5'5 five, five and 3 quarters, um, high forehead, blue eyes, uh, and you can see the other characteristics here. And one more slide uh, of his passport. And very interestingly here, when you're looking for affidavits to say this is the person to whom we're giving a passport, he has his documentation from the Red Cross, but he also has the support of a friend named Frank Hendy in Vermont. Now, we all know Hendy descendants in Vermont, yes. so this is uh, really, really neat that you once again have a convergence of lots of families uh, that we know. So he is undertaking war relief work. He's working for the Red Cross. And the, the Red Cross still does a lot of remarkable good service in places throughout the world. But what he's really doing in, in this next phase of his life, it's like Doctors Without Borders. So you go and you're bringing your medical knowledge and your expertise to an area of the world where your skills uh, are greatly needed. So this is one of the pictures uh, that you found here. And before we look at this in detail, what do you think this is a picture of? And as you look at the objects here, what do you think is going on? Well, I was, um, from looking at it, I was under the impression that it must have been maybe an orphanage of some kind. and. Um and uh, that's just the giant vat of, uh, of food, actually. Yep. And then they yep. just kind of scoop it out in everybody's cups. And uh, well, that's kind of, a, kind of a basic way to look at it. But that's kind of how I interpreted it. You yep. know, You're so, absolutely yeah. right. It is an orphanage. And that's a, a cauldron of food. And some of these children do not look well nourished. Uh, one of the reasons that their uh, heads are covered is that in packed orphanages, one of the, the problems is lice. And lice uh, breed typhus, and this would be one of the great wartime killers. Um, and you have, uh, because you have the original picture, we have the back um, of the photograph. So is there anything here that you want to comment on? Um, well, when I, I saw that it said the American Red Cross, yep. and, um, and I saw that uh, Dr. Frost's name was there, so I knew there was that, that linkage. Um, but really beyond that, I really wasn't entirely sure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, any clues to what country is being shown here? I actually, I wasn't sure if it was Serbia or maybe perhaps Serbia. That's what I was thinking. It is, it is it, Serbia, yeah. and you can see that it's written in, in French, Serbi, S-T-R-B-I-E. And what you have in the upper, um, the upper left-hand corner is a crest in Cyrillic, because Serbia uses the Cyrillic alphabet. It's very oriented towards Russia. Um, I couldn't quite make that out. It would be a painstaking process of trans, <laughs> transposing the letters. I didn't do that. but. I'm able to tell you exactly where this location is. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> so here is the location. It is the town of Pristina, Pristina. And the arrow points to a region uh, of Serbia called Kosovo. Now, do you remember when you were in high school in the 90s why Kosovo was in the news so much? Uh, there was, well, there was unrest, I believe. Yes, so that's, yes. Uh, yes, that's, uh, as I recall. Yep. Uh, 
Yes, this was, uh, Balkans have been called the powder keg of Europe. And then at the start of the 20th century and in the 90s, uh, just generations of tribal um, unrest. So one of the things that it, when you were, let's say, in elementary school, Bosnia, Serbia, Montenegro, Croatia would have been um, old designations on the map because it was all Yugoslavia. But the complexity of the Balkans that we have to understand to put what Dr. Frost did in context is that Bosnia uh, was a province of Austria um, uh, until World War I. And the fuse that lit the powder keg was the assassination in Sarajevo, in the capital of Bosnia, when the Archduke uh, and his wife were assassinated by a Serb. So as the sides lined up for World War I, you have Bosnia on the side of Austria, which is on the side of Germany. And the Serbs were allied with the Russians, who were allied with the French, and then the British get. So with all this complication, we have Serbia throughout World War I on our side, the side of the Allies. And since Serbia was already racked uh, by incessant warfare, there were two Balkan wars previous to World War I. This was part of the Red Cross mission. And in looking a little further for all of this, I actually found some supporting photographs from the Library of Congress from the same mission. So this comes from the Library of Congress archives with the caption, and it reads, Tubercular Children of Serbia, a typical tuberculosis camp established for sick children of the Balkans. It is these children that the American Red Cross is helping in its continued program of medical relief for Serbia. In the next uh, picture here, we have similar to the little hats that we see in the, in the picture that you found, lined up for breakfast, 900 children and adults are fed every day at the American Red Cross station in Pristina, Serbia. The children in the picture have come with their jugs for their portion of a wholesome meat and vegetable soup which is prepared in the house. So this is exactly, this could be a sequel down to the kids in their cups of the picture that wow, you found. That is, that is fascinating, yes. <laughs> and uh, lastly, um, one other thing here, and this is where the, the banner would come in handy because you have American doctors at work in Serbia. In one of the oldest and quaintest towns in Southern Europe, Prishin or Pristina, Serbia, this American Red Cross doctor is attending to all the surgical work of the population of 100,000 souls. And the person who is being operated on was the victim of a bandit raid. So again, you have this incessant warfare that's gone on since the 14th century between Slavs and the Ottomans and uh, Muslims and Christians and Orthodox. So you can think of someone operating in a tent or performing some basic humanitarian aid and you need these banners because it has to show to the rest of the population, please don't shoot, right, I'm yeah. here, <laughs> I'm here to do some good. And we know uh, exactly uh, when uh, Dr. Frost's service ends because here we have him after a stint of several months, he returns home. And if you look on line 10 here, uh, there's Dr. Frost, he is coming home to Burlington, Vermont, and he is sailing from Boulogne aboard the New Amsterdam. Now the funny thing is, the only cruise ship that I've ever been on in my entire life is the New Amsterdam. It's not this New Amsterdam, which is from the Holland America line, but this was its predecessor. Uh -huh. So I thought, wow, I know what that is, that's the New Amsterdam. 
So at this point, after this whole humanitarian mission that was so important to him, obviously, because all of these objects had been preserved, um, he comes home to be uh, a country doctor. So in the time that we have left, uh, let's look a little bit about who Dr. Frost was as uh, a person. And in the Burlington Daily Press, we have his engagement. And you notice the, the, the chatty way um, in which announcements were put in the paper back then. Invitations have been issued by Reverend and Mrs. Henry Gulick of Charlotte for the marriage of their daughter, Christine Emerson, to Dr. Harry Leslie Frost. And this is what was in the pocket that yes. you found. And there is Christine. So obviously, with this being in the wallet of his uniform, he's taking his wife's picture with him. It remained with him. So Christine vicariously is traveling with Harry uh, to all of these places in the Balkans. And as we look further, at his life, he and his family uh, settled in Pittsford in, in the house that you know early on in the uh, early 1920s. Uh, here we have an excerpt from the 1930 census. So there's Harry Frost, head of household. Very interestingly, his home value is $5,000. If we had time to look at everybody else along the Ethan Allen Highway, not everyone's home was worth $5,000, nor did they own it. So we have here that he owns his house, it's worth $5,000. The R stands for the fact that he had a radio. Not everyone had a radio in 1930. We have his wife, we have his son Malcolm, who died young. He was a World War II uh, veteran. We have Emerson, whom I remember well, who was two and a half at this point. And we have uh, Dr. Frost's mother-in-law living with him. And here is something you don't find with too many people in Pittsburgh in 1930. The Frosts are wealthy enough that they have a servant living with them. So we have Gertrude Johnson, who is a 15-year-old servant. So obviously, he was able to earn a successful enough living from his medical practice uh, wow. that they could have they could have a servant. Wow. And one of the reasons that perhaps we have a bit of a disconnect um, to the actual family of uh, Robert uh, of Dr. Frost is that he died uh, sadly and relatively suddenly at the age of 53. So in October of 1943, he went in for a routine gallbladder operation. Now today, uh, gallbladders can be done if there are no complications on an outpatient basis. In the 40s and right up until the 1960s, a gallbladder was still very, very serious surgery. And uh, he died uh, of peritonitis. So he died as a result of complications from his gallbladder surgery. And if you notice here in this obituary from uh, the Rutland Herald, uh, it states, he practiced for nearly 30 years in Pittsburgh. Uh, he opened an office in Rutland. Now the part that connects to everything that you have brought to us this morning, he served overseas in the first war, world war as a captain and after the armistice was transferred to the Red Cross where he was in charge of a hospital unit in the Balkans for six months. So there you have wow, it. That's, uh, there, yeah. There's the story. <laughs> and uh, I think we come full circle with all of this. That is fantastic. <laughs> so in uh, the few moments we have remaining, I'll give the last word to you. Well, I can't thank you enough, honestly, for uh, kind of putting it all together because I've had it you know, I've had it for a good six months now, looking at it, trying to figure it out. So it's, I really do appreciate it. Well, yeah. thank you. It's been great fun. Yes, thank you again.